Okay, hello. Um, my name is Frederick Heinzel. Um, I, I've been affiliated with the uh, Tampa VA for some time, and uh, I had given previous talks on leprosy. So this is an update to my older talks. Um, and without further ado, uh, the leprosy learning objectives for this uh, is to understand epidemiology and pathobiology of human infection with Mycobacterium librae. Uh, to be able to diagnose the spectral presentations of tuberculoid and lepromatous leprosy, to formulate a treatment plan tailored for the different forms of leprosy, and to understand, monitor, and treat the complications of leprosy therapy. Which is kind of interesting. You have a problem, and then the problem evolves as you treat it. So this this is a very uh, interesting sort of uh, um, thing. Excuse me. <coughs> Mycobacterium leprae, its causative agent of leprosy, is an acid fast bacillus that infects humans and a nine banded armadillo. It's an obligate intracellular pathogen. It does not grow in bacteriologic media or tissue culture. Growth in susceptible humans and armadillos is slow and is temperature restricted to less than 37 degrees. They like to live at cool temperatures in tissues. Uh, immunocompromised mice, either the severe combined immunodeficiency or nude mice, which don't have T cells, are used to grow M. Libre for research purposes. The doubling time in those mice for the organism is uh, approximately 14 days. So why does the leprosy bacillus want to live within the cell? It's an obligate intracellular pathogen. Does anyone have any ideas? Just a little bit of audience participation. Okay, so the reason for that is that the um, uh, leprosy genome is smaller than that of tuberculosis. It probably, if you thought it evolved from tuberculosis at some point, it's lost a lot of DNA. Uh, there's gene deletion, loss of gene function, and repeated recombination of repetitive sequences, uh, loss of important metabolic activity, et cetera, for per precursors, catabolic, oxidative, and respiratory chain intermediates. All these things that allows the leprosy bacillus to be happy and wealthy inside the uh, uh, intracellular abode. Um, so to put it precisely, it's a metabolically challenged organism that has to use, uh, that has to scavenge nutrients from inside the cell. Um, there are a lot of other organisms, uh, rickettsia and others, uh, do that as well. Okay, S since my last talk um, in 2008, uh, there were a series of cases of leprosy that were distinctly different from that of normal leprosy. Uh, in particular, uh, unlike normal leprosy, which just has uh, uh, you know, a mild uh, skin rashes, um, these patients actually had ulcerating lesions, uh, and they also had uh, diffuse um, infiltrates of acid fast bacteria in visceral organs, which is distinctly different from uh, classic uh, leprosy. Um, this was uh, 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 found to be very different. It was about a 20% difference by 16S RNA criteria. It's clearly a distinct species. M. lepromatosis uh, is like Mike Leper. It cannot be cultured, but it actually is fatal in some patients. And so that, that's, that's a, a very oddball variant. There are very few cases. I spent a lot of time trying to look through uh, um, the results of, of uh, the treatment. Uh, they seem to respond to the multiple uh, um, uh, uh, multiple antibiotics, uh, but there, there's really a lot that's not known about that. So there will probably be more about that in the future, but it's probably pretty rare at this point. So how old is leprosy? Um, there's compelling data that uh, it's uh, at least approximately 2000, it, it, it was, um, it was uh, present in India uh, at approximately 2000 BC. Now that's not the oldest uh, infectious disease uh, that's uncovered by sort of archaeologic techniques. Um, uh, the other infections that are even older than that are, of course, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, and syphilis. Okay, so in this case, the presence of leprosy in skeletal material dates to the post open phase of the Indus Age and suggests the M. Lepre evolved in Africa with subsequent migration to India in, in the late Holocene. The, the issue of Africa here is going to kind of resonate through a couple of my other slides about you know, exactly where did uh, uh, um, leprosy develop and where is it still present. 
Uh, and generally what they saw, these erosions in a skull here, and these are very characteristic that, you know, from uh, recent years, people have, uh, uh, have CT scans, and they show these same sort of erosions here. So this is thought to be a good surrogate uh, uh, for um, the, the changes um, in uh, leprosy in the skull. Okay, there's a long history of leprosy. Uh, most of us know a lot about that, but um, you know, in the biblical ages, it was unclean. People were banished from society. Medieval Europe, they were declared legally dead. Muhammad exhorted his followers to flee lepers as from a lion. The 1900s, uh, warning cowbells placed around the neck, uh, as mostly in uh, Norway, uh, patients were confined to leprosoriums. In 1940, Dapsone was shown to treat tuberculosis leprosy, and that was the first drug that really had a significant effect on, on leprosy, and we're still using it uh, in combination with other drugs, though. Um, cases declined from 12 to 6 million over 10 years, uh, probably starting in the 50s, and the WHO attempts to, to eradicate leprosy by uh, year 2000, which was uh, a, a major uh, uh, goal of uh, WHO uh, was a failure, and uh, mostly because uh, they they cannot capture. Well, we'll get to it later. But the the duration of time it takes for someone to uh, develop clinical leprosy after they've uh, acquired a bacterium, there's five to ten years in between. So it's very hard to treat people who are already developing the disease, but they can't be recognized. So leprosy is really a tale of two diseases. First, it's a chronic mycobacterial infection um, that results in spectral disease manifestations in the skin that reflect highly polarized cellular immune responses within the infected dermis and subcutaneous tissues. Uh, this disease is readily curable using available antibiotics. But it is also a disabling peripheral neuropathy, uh, neuropathic amylipre. Uh, invade peripheral nerve cells, specifically the Schwann cell, uh, which is how it gets into peripheral nerve cells, and they're targeted by uh, Th1 T cells, cells uh, which is called a Th1 granulomatous response, which is very destructive to the nerve. Basically, the immune system recognizes that the bacteria is inside the nerve and it attacks the nerve and destroys it. Uh, loss of motor function then leads to neuropathic deformities and loss of pain cessation that results in pressure sores, and that has a lot to do with the, the, the disabling uh, aspects of, of leprosy. So this is what a uh, acid fast stain of your subcutaneous tissue would look like if you have leprosy. And this is just packed solid with acid fast bacilli, mycobacterium leprae. Uh, you can't miss it. You can do a little skin slit, you can put a little s and then smear on a slide and do an acid fast stain. They'll be all over the place. Now this is Arguably, someone has a very high load of uh, mycobacterium libre, and later on I'll talk about how this is actually part of the lepromonous side of the spectrum. Uh, this is an example of what happens to a nerve that's being attacked uh, uh, after uh, it's been invaded by uh, the leprosy bacillus, and you're seeing these huge um, tubercular type uh, uh, granulomas in there, and those are causing a, a great deal of destruction. So. It, it, this is actually a, a, a sort of a cardinal feature of tuberculoid leprosy, which is another part of the spectrum. I'll get to that a little bit later. Clinical diagnosis of leprosy is usually pretty easy. Um, they have skin lesions that are, uh, are, are typically consistent with leprosy if they have definite sensory loss. You, you basically, you go to the lesion, mostly the center of the lesion or even at the edge of it, poke them with a pin. If they can't feel it, then that, that's, that's clearly abnormal. Sometimes you'll have big, thickened nerves. Either you, know, you can have them along the neck, you can have the perineal, uh, they can be ulnar, they can be uh, uh, I I any of the other major nerves. And uh, that is also a characteristic finding of tuberculoid leprosy. Um, and then finally, you, you can just get skin smears. You get a little blade, you just cut open the skin and do a smear, uh, use acid fast stain, and you'll, you'll see the organism. So that really gives you a big hint. Um, the important thing there, too, is that even though you see all these bacilli, they're just all over the place. You can put them in any culture media in the world, and they're not going to grow because they, they just don't grow in culture media. They don't grow in tissue culture. So. Um, that that's, would be absolutely diagnostic of uh, leprosy in that situation. 
Okay, so one of the major factors, one of the major features of leprosy is its ability to destroy nerves. And this is just a little bit of the microbiology involved with this. Uh, the molecular basis for M. leprae neurotrophism, uh, M. leprae bacteria bind to, oh God, okay, I'm going to have to twist around this way. <laughs> okay, um, where are we? Um, I thought this was supposed to have like a little, Okay, here we go. Nope. Must not be turned on. Oh. Okay, well here I'll just I'll just talk this through. Okay, so what what you're looking at in the slide here is you see these the green uh, uh, bacilli at the end, which is M. Libri, and it's binding to a uh, what they call an intermediate filament uh, that is a structural protein that exists on the outside of the cell. Its role is basically to define a polarity of uh, the membrane, this, you know, by laminar membrane. And, um, and they also then develop, form these very extensive lattices that uh, connect to other cells, that connect to other immune filaments, and, you know, it's the whole uh, uh, structure around all the cells. Um, but M. Libri uh, binds with high affinity the laminin. Um, the laminin with the, the M. Libri attached to it then attaches to alpha dystroglycan, which is a uh, cell surface uh, receptor. Um, and that actually turns to be a portal into the cell. So then the leprosy bacillus gets into the cell. And that's how the infection develops. Um, this is a Schwann cell. A Schwann cell is a uh, um, sort of a, uh, a nervous system supporting cell what it does is it, it, it kind of feeds the axon and it also provides the um, uh, lamellar uh, um, structure around the axons, uh, which is a myelinated sheaths that are wrapped around and around the, the, the axon. It's interesting that the same receptor is involved in um, lipocoria meningitis and loss of fever virus neural invasions. And this, is, this happens a lot in, in uh, infections. Uh, sometimes the same receptor can let several different organisms in. Okay, so this is your, your typical uh, nerve cell now. And you can see those little, where you have the little, when you look at the, it, where the cut edge on, some of those have like uh, a little uh, black um, things round and round the, the axon. And you can see it over here on the, uh, the electron microscope. As there's the axon, those are like the nerve, the axon's coming down, and that's your myelinated sheath around it. The myelinated sheath is important for preserving the action potential. It's almost like a um, uh, uh, insulation on a wire is how it works. Uh, if the M. Libri gets into the Schwann cell, it kills the Schwann cell, and essentially it kills uh, the nerve by uh, extension. So that's how that happens. Once that happens, you have you have, they have paralysis or you have loss in sensation. On the left upper hand side there, this is a classic radial nerve palsy, uh, which, uh, you know, radial nerve allows you to do this, and it falls down like that. And I, I do believe the markings there are uh, designating the degree where they've lost sensation as well. The next one down there is um, and uh, is either a median or ulnar nerve neuropathy. Um, my rehab friends tell me that it's hard to distinguish between ulnar claw or what they call um, uh, apan deformity. <clears throat> Mostly it has to do if you've, 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 uh, you've lost action of the thenar eminence and you, you kind of curl up your uh, fingers a little bit. And then finally, if you lose sensation, you develop these pressure ulcers, and uh, that's what leads to a lot of the deformities. Okay, so the characteristic findings uh, when you look at a patient with leprosy is they're going to have these kind of markings here, sort of uh, you have these uh, circumlinear um, uh, markings, either it's darker in the middle, it can be lighter in the middle. The key thing here is if you have a pin with you, you just poke in there, if they don't feel anything, you know, you're, you're well on your way to establishing a diagnosis of leprosy. Okay, so where is leprosy in the world? Um, you know, we have a lot of talk, you know, we've discussed a lot about armadillos, but I'm going to try and give a little more of a global view here. Um, this is uh, back probably about 19, um, uh, you know, um, probably around 1990 or so. Um, there, 
there has been leprosy for a long time in Brazil. You see a lot of leprosy in Africa and even over in China and most of the Indonesian, uh, the uh, Indochina um, areas. Um, but more recently, what we've seen in the United States is that there's increasing evidence that there is zoonotic transmission of leprosy within the southern United States. And this was determined to be due to um, um, armadillos infected with leprosy. Uh, if they're in close contact of humans or people who eat the meat, then they're at risk of infection. So far right now, um, years ago, uh, armadillos had not entered into the US. And so what we're looking at here is just this potential range. Armadillos are continuing to move northward. Uh, and they've been doing that for about 150 years. So it's very likely that we're going to continue to have armadillo infestations in the southern United States. Okay, armadillo, it's nine-banded armadillo marching northward. Okay, so how is leprosy transmitted in the continental United States? Uh, it's zoonotic transmission, I just mentioned, uh, and leprosy infected armadillos. Um, uh, and there's a good concordance. Uh, spontaneous human leprosy cases in the southern USA are co-endemic with distribution of armadillos. That's, that's nice. DNA polymorphisms and nucleotide polymorphisms are identical for amylipri DNA in infected armadillos and humans. And that is proof positive that that organism has transferred uh, that uh, bug into uh, humans from armadillos. Um, when, you, when you go other parts of the world where they have other armadillo-like organisms, um, they, they don't have this same DNA sequence. One third of leprosy cases in the USA are associated with ingestion or prolonged contact with infected armadillos. This is all stuff that's been new in the last couple of months. Uh, so conclusion, armadillos are a large natural reservoir for M. leprae transmission in southern United States. Now, having said that, it, I th a lot of people really grabbed onto the idea that armadillo cause all, is the cause of all leprosy uh, in, in the world. And I, I want to sort of disillusion um, uh, uh, some of you about this. Um, so the nine-banded armadillos only recently extended their range northwards into the USA. Um, so this is, this is something that's, that's very new. However, leprosy has been present in Texas and Louisiana prior to the arrival of armadillos, in many cases well back into the 1980s. So it's been around for quite a while. Uh, leprosy is highly prevalent in China, Africa, and India, despite the absence of armadillos in those countries. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about person-to-person -person spread of disease, anthropogenic transmission, probably due to nasal discharge of lepromonous leprosy patients. Their nasal discharge is absolutely full of acid fast bacilli of uh, amylipri. Okay, so there's, there's probably both zoonotic and anthropogenic transmission. <coughs> okay, in terms of the, the spectral manifestations of leprosy, uh, you um, a couple of different terms are used, but posse bacillary is a term for not having a lot of bacteria uh, in the skin. And uh, in th these patients, uh, they have maybe... Um, uh, 10 million bacilli per body. Yeah, I don't know how, exactly how they figured that out. They probably just take a little skin snips and then extrapolate. Um, th this is really part of the tuberculoid uh, range because they don't have many bacteria. They have effective so many immunity. They have, um, you can do a skin test uh, from uh, dead leprosy bac bacilli and they give you a nice uh, uh, positive uh, skin test. Um, they have granulobus, cassius necrosis, may heal spontaneously. Unfortunately, these are the conditions that can also cause the ner nerves to die. Multibacillary means you have a lot of bacilli, something like, uh, oh God, you know, we're, we're up into like, you know, billions of bacilli per gram of just random skin biopsy. They have very ineffective cell immunity. The, uh, they don't make interferon gamma, which is what protects you in tuberculoid. Uh, and in fact, uh, they, they have kind of they don't seem to have a lot of, uh, um, they ba basically they continue growing. Um, in Lepromonas, you see macrophages uh, extensively infiltrating skin uh, without granuloma formation, uh, and they rarely resolve without prolonged therapy. On the tuberculoid side, um, they're pretty easy to treat. Sometimes you have so, many, so few organisms that antibiotics really have a chance to make some inroads. 
Okay, and it just this is just one other um, uh, a graphic, uh, just pointing out again when it says TT, that's tuberculoid leprosy. Um, that that's when they tend to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have a lot of granulomas. As we go towards the middle, where it's kind of in the mid range, you have fewer granulomas. Uh, and then on the far right side, you have a, just a very bland uh, mononuclear cell infiltrate. We have a, a acid fast stain on the bottom. On the left hand side, which is tuberculite, which we know is, is um, uh, a situation where you actually can kill the leprosy bacillus most of the time. So you only see a few of those little red um, bacteria there. But when you get to the far right side, they're absolutely packed. You have all of these organisms that are growing up, and that's more to the, the, the uh, leprominous side of uh, the, the disease. So a spectral disease, a lot of this has to do with the type of cytokines and immune responses that are provided. It works well on one side, on the tuberculoid, uh, and uh, but it doesn't kill the bacteria on the lepromonas side. Oh, say so tuberculosis leprosy in terms of what they look like on the skin, they have relatively few macules, maybe one to ten. That's in the very earliest, earliest stage. Uh, they're hypopigmented, anesthetic, uh, raised uh, borders, and bacteria absent respiratory secretions at this early point of disease. Uh, here you can see just a very benign lesion right here. Here you see one has some uh, where the edges are a little raised. There's all sorts of variants here. I'll just go through a few of these. Uh, people with dark skin, uh, this turns up, uh, uh, this is very easy to see. Uh, they have some big uh, patches there, and of course they're all going to have some leprosy bacilli in there. Now, as you go further towards the lepromonous end of the spectrum, uh, you start seeing these uh, lesions becoming uh, symmetric, sometimes in a butterfly pattern. And uh, what you also see now, Back, going back to tuberculoid, tuberculoid, when it's damaging nerves, you often have big, thickened nerves under the skin. A couple places you can see that. So uh, there, these are a couple different signs of the different uh, stages of leprosy. Lepromonas is, is um, pretty amazing. Um, there are many macules. Uh, they also start turning into big nodules and plaques. The dermis is thickened. The warm skin areas, remember, they, they, the bacteria doesn't want to grow in, in cool areas. The warm skin, so the scalp, the midline of the back, the axillus are all spared. They look like normal tissue. Um, it, and then uh, eventually they can have so much uh, 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 lepromatous infiltrate that it's called diffuse lepromatosis. And that's a little confusing because we're going to be talking um, you know, I talked a little bit about that, that new type of uh, leprosy. And um, we had this d term diffuse lepromatosis before they actually gave a species name to that other strain of microbacteria. Eyebrows eventually get lost and eventually start having, you know, this is the sort of thing you'd see in their face. Uh, it's very knobby. These are all plaques. Uh, you know, if you were to take a little piece of the tissue in it, it's just absolutely teeming with uh, acid fast bacillus. Uh, eventually, the upper respiratory tract becomes granulomatous. Uh, uh, you have acid fast bacilli are seen in the nasal secretion. Nasal collapse ensues. And they think at this point is when, uh, as people are blowing their nose or you know having secretions coming out of their nose, is that they may be spreading uh, M. leprae in uh, the, uh, the general area. And that may be one of the, the, the sources of transmission, human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, it's a little hard to prove. Um, there's not a lot of variation in uh, M. Libri DNA, so you can't really do much in the way of fingerprinting and make some sense out of that. It's been done in China, and you can go 100 miles in a circle around an area of leprosy in China, and they have basically the exact same uh, DNA complement. All right. Uh, other, I, I talked a little bit about these other diagnostics, the skin smear. You can actually calculate a bacillary index. I'm not going to go there. That, that's just for people who work in the field all the time know what they're doing. And a differential diagnosis would be continuous leishmaniasis. And I'll talk about leishmaniasis in another talk. Um, and you're going to find people who have look just like lepromatous leprosy. It's the same thing. Instead of being uh, the tissue infiltrated with uh, M. leprae is now uh, infiltrated with uh, leishmania, many number of species. Okay, uh, leprosy is a disease of chronic physical disability. Um, of course, the only bacteria that selectively infects nerves in humans. The immune response to leprosy bacillus injures nerves through collateral damage in a Schwann cell is the primary target. Uh, and there's various other nerves that also get involved too. It's it's really pretty devastating. 
Uh, Olar nerve is common, uh, and it gives you a characteristic hand change called bishops of benediction hand. Again, as I mentioned earlier, probably median nerve can do the same sort of thing. Some claw hand. It's either ulnar claw or median claw hand. And radian nerve, of course, is the wrist drop. All right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Um, uh, the WHO recommendation, there are two recommendations for treatment of, of leprosy. There's the WHO recommendations, and there's the National Hansen's Disease Program recommendations. Uh, WHO recommendations are combination therapy for 12 months initially uh, with dapsone and clofazamine. And they use rifampin at 600 milligrams uh, given every month. Uh, it just minimizes risk of antibiotic resistance. That's one of the important things. If you treat with dapsone only, you tend to see a lot of dapsone resistance. In this case, they're, they're using this combination therapy to try and knock down antibiotic resistance. Um, now, for posse bacillary, that, that's pretty easy. You usually have a single skin lesion. Dapsone alone, alone can occasionally treat it, or dapsone and rifampin probably will work very well. Uh, currently, they, they recommend uh, six months. And for multibacillary, I must have dropped off my slide somehow. All right, so leprosy treatment in the U.S., though, differs from WHO recommendations. Um, multibacillary uh, leprosy, uh, trifampin 600 milligrams daily, not monthly, daily, plus dapsone 100 milligrams daily for three years. And then posse bacillary leprosy, it's, it's, it's a little easier. It's trifampin 600 milligrams daily, plus dapsone, uh, and for six months, because this is a, a, a lesion that's easier to treat. Now, there, there, some of the differences between uh, the WHO and the National uh, Hansen's program uh, are, are fairly dramatic. Um, for the WHO, uh, they're, 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 they're somewhat under-treating patients. I mean, they probably get away with that. Um, part of the problem is WHO is a uh, financially challenged organization. And they, they sometimes run into shortages of some of these antibiotics. Uh, when you go to the sort of USA standards, which is the National Hansen's Disease uh, Program, um, it's, they're actually, um, for the National Hansen's Disease Program, they're actually treating with rifampin 600 milligram daily. OK, so how do we know? So there's a lot of other antibiotics that are coming to the front that are also effective in leprosy. So we actually we probably have a, 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 um, a lot of options still. And, but this gets to the question of how do we know that the, the antibiotics are working? Well, you could treat the patient and see what's happening. But if you really want to just get sort of a, a preview of whether an antibiotic is going to work, uh, this is where we go to the immunodeficient mice. You can infect a, uh, a T cell deficient mice with um, the M. leprae uh, very easily. And then you can treat them with um, antibiotics in vivo. And then, uh, you know, you sacrifice them later and you count the number of organisms. And that can tell you, it's like an MIC. You can do it that way. Uh, just sort of the multi-drug therapy kits that WHO uh, uses overseas. They have them for kids, they have them for adults. It's very efficient. Okay, so assessing the therapeutic response. Um, if, um, if, you're, if you're doing well for positive bacillary disease, skin nodules flatten, plaques flatten, scarring may persist uh, if there's Okay, um, and after, if the nerves have been previously damaged, um, you're, you're probably not going to be able to treat them with antibiotics. They're probably going to have some residual um, uh, outcome from that. So, now the other thing about leprosy that's very strange is that there are uh, very strange responses that occur when you treat the patients. In this case, this is a patient that's been treated uh, probably for um, uh, Lepromonus leprae, probably, probably in the intermediate range. And what they, you see here are these inflammatory lesions on the skin, see like welts. Uh, you can see this on, on the uh, cheek of this guy right here. And that's kind of a reversal reaction. What happens is, as you kill the bacteria, you, you shift the immune response from something that I would say kind of benign, like Th2 response, to a Th1 response. And now this is a newly constituted inflammatory response um, centered on the, the leprosy lesions. Um, these can cause fever. They can actually cause ulcers. They can be very, they can be very painful. And um, I've treated some of these patients in the past, in, in, in Cleveland, people from Puerto Rico, and others. And um, th these are the people you treat for three years with corticosteroids. 
although I'm jumping ahead a little bit. The other lesion you're going to get, the other sort of uh, uh, immunologic consequence of treatment of leprosy is erythema nodosum leprosum. Um, this is not so much a, a T-cell mediated response, it's really more of a uh, antibody mediated vasculitis that uh, attacks um, uh, uh, the areas of um, uh, leprosy infiltration. Um, and in order to, to, to treat these, uh, dysvasculitis uh, requires long doses of corticosteroids, as I mentioned, sometimes for years. Uh, you have to continue anti-leprosy drugs in this case, though, because you still got to keep knocking the number of uh, uh, bacteria down. Um, the problem with these, these patients develop ulcerations. They can also, um, uh, those, those can be very painful lesions. And it turns out that in 1991, Dr. Gia Kaplan, Kaplan um, this is someone I bounced into once before, but um, this, uh, um, they found that thalidomide decreased TNF alpha levels in leprosy by enhancing the degradation of its mRNA. And it's interesting, a lot of, der a lot of inflammatory lesions now that are well treated with thalidomide across, you know, you, you, you know it's, if you're a woman, I mean, there have to be all sorts of, you know, guidelines and uh, 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 safety nets in, in place. But uh, thalidomide actually is, is a fairly effective antagonist of TNF alpha. To my knowledge, I don't know if anyone's actually treated these patients with a uh, TNF uh, active antibody. So I'll look around for that at some point. Okay, so leprosy, can it be eradicated? What a WHO set for a year 2000 failed. Unclear if mass chemotherapy is working, given the long delay before presentation. Armadillos will likely persist as an important reservoir in the United States. And the largest reservoir for dissemination of leprosy world is probably still contact with lepromonous patients given the fact that no armadillos in Africa, China, uh, and uh, they, they still have a, a lot of human leprosy.